going to record. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm sure a few more people will kind of trickle in. So I'm going to talk a little bit slowly here at the beginning and just remind you all of some Zoom etiquette. I know everybody's a pro at this point, but I, I do want to welcome you to turn on your video, especially after Patty's presentation, when we shift into a Q&A period, you're welcome to turn on your video, ask questions either by unmuting yourself or through the chat. We're very flexible with all of that. Um, my name is Amanda Rainey. I'm the user experience and learning manager with the GVSU Art Gallery. I also want to introduce my colleague Joel, who will be helping uh, to field questions through the chat at the end. So you'll you may hear him pipe in towards the end. Um, of course, today we're here for the on the wall artist talk featuring Patty Carroll, who I'm, I'll introduce in just a moment. I want to explain what on the wall artist talks are. They're talks that feature artists whose work is up on a wall somewhere on campus, discussing their creative process and how that may intersect with other fields of study. So Patty Carroll's work is currently in two locations on campus, and then we have more of her work that you can see in our database that's currently in storage waiting for a home. Um, and those two locations are the Center for Women's and Gender Equity, and then a computer lab on the second floor of Manitou Hall. A little more information about the GVSU Art Gallery, especially for those of us, for those of you who are new to our events, welcome if this is the first art gallery event that you've attended. The GVSU Art Gallery actually serves the entire university community across all of our campuses. Grand Valley holds the second largest art collection in the state of Michigan, and artwork is thoughtfully curated into every university building. We believe that visual art viewing experiences have the power to spark conversations, action, and reflection on core themes of social justice, human rights, and empathy that align with the university's values and philosophy of liberal education. So with that, I'd like to welcome Patty Carroll. I'm going to pin Patty to the top so you all see her. Um, Patty Carroll has been known for her highly intense saturated color photographs since the 1970s. Her most recent project, Anonymous Women, consists of a three-part series of studio installations made for the camera, addressing women and their complicated relationships with domesticity. By camouflaging the figure in drapery and or domestic objects, Patty Carroll creates a dark and humorous game of hide and seek between her viewers and the anonymous women. The photographs were published as a monograph titled Anonymous Women, officially released in January 2017 by Daylight Books, and most recently uh, titled Anonymous Women Domestic Demise, which was published in 2020 by Ain't Bad, which is an independent publisher of contemporary art. And I looked and it looks like they're sold out of that already, which is amazing. Yes. So with that, I'd like to welcome you, Patty. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to you. Thank you. Actually, uh, if you would like a copy, my dealer, my gallery in Houston, my gallery dealer is, she's slightly crazy, but wonderful. And um, her name is Catherine Couturier. And she bought the, the rest of the books when it was like down to, I don't know, I don't know how many, less than a hundred. And so she has them all in Houston. So if you want one of those books, all you have to do is contact her and she will send it to you. So anyway, that was an ad for the book. None of which do I, you know, do I see the benefits of or the whatever, certainly no profits, but anyway. Uh, anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming and thank you for doing this. And I am very excited to uh, talk to you about this work. Also, um, I'm very thankful to uh, Grand Valley State University to, um, to have accepted a lot of this work. Um, I, I really needed to get it out of my studio but I, did, I didn't want to, but I wanted other people to enjoy it. So hopefully you will, and hopefully they will keep changing, you know, the pictures around, et cetera. But today I'll show you how this project began and where it has led to, okay? 
So on to my sharing of my screen, folks. Give me a second here. This is it. And okay. So this is um, this was a kind of can you see the whole thing here? Uh oh. Go back. Can you see this whole screen? I yes. mean, uh, okay. Anyway, this was a little um, statement that a writer wrote about these crazy pictures. Um, and I just want to say before we look at the pictures that I think every artist has a, a point in their life where everything sort of gels or comes together or is a memory or some little specific thing. For some people, it could be an actual event and some people it could be a time of life or it, some people it could be a memory that they wanna keep creating or whatever, but it's usually, one is usually able to trace uh, somebody's work back to um, various threads. So I'm gonna show you part of these. Now, all of these pictures are about women and the home. And it started and about leaving home, coming home, finding home, etc. So So I use Dorothy as a kind of stand-in for my myself and for this idea of home. Uh, and we moved to uh, Britain in the 1990s. And before before all this, I was out taking pictures out in the world. I was, um, you know, photographing at night using a tripod, photographing hot dog stands, doing all kinds of other things. But then I was really away from the USA where my work was based. And we were living in Britain and a lot of the interiors looked like this beautiful but elaborate interior. And um, I really recognized that I was no longer in suburban Midwestern Chicago or anywhere near it. And so uh, I started thinking about what home is and what it means, et cetera. So I started this project um, in London with these pictures and I, I called her the anonymous woman. Um, they were just, as you can see, a part of a woman's torso um, it was a white woman, so we took some white kind of clown paint and painted it on her, and then I would uh, put something over her head so you didn't see her identity. And a lot of this was because I was suddenly in a place where nobody knew me as a teacher or a photographer in a, any professional way, but rather as Mrs. Jones. And so I was always being seen through my domestic status. And I started thinking more about how you know, housewife became a name and how that that whole thing worked out. And and I started thinking about women being identified only through their domestic status. And think to yourself, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. I was so glad to come back to the United States. And so what we did when we came back is we bought the ideal house I never had as a kid. It was a 1950s ranch house and it had this particular pink kitchen, which still exists today. And so I started this whole um, crazy, I guess you might say, project of restoring this house to its former beauty from 1952 and um, kept all the pink appliances and painted the walls pink and, and kept going. And I was scouring flea markets and going to estate sales, etc. And it kind of led me to thinking about home again in a different way. Um, simultaneously, this is a picture of my niece, Kathleen, who was um, a in the Marines at the time, and it was around 2003 that this happened. Uh, and she um, was deployed in the first uh, sortie going to Iraq. And she sent this picture home to us at the same time. Now, this was sort of ironic to me because uh, I was 
you know, madly, obsessively making this new home that I was doing that was pink and cute and all that stuff. And she was sitting there on the desert with, you know, her her gun strapped to her. And I also started thinking about the women whose homes were being destroyed at the same time. And so there was this dichotomy of like silliness versus heaviness. And then I'm, I'm showing you some of the influences of how I got to these drapery pictures. So a lot of people have said to me, well, these, these pictures relate to the burqa and in some ways they do, but the, the, um, the burqa or many women clothe themselves, especially in uh, Eastern uh, countries. And I realized that they felt safer in them. <laughs> it's not just like we in the United States think, oh my God, this is terrible. They're covering themselves up. But on some level, it's kind of a, a nice way of hiding who you are from the rest of the world. The image on the right is a doll from Morocco that my father brought me when I was like, I don't know, a really young kid. And I think these things kind of coalesced in my head, you know, back to this idea. And so this was one of the first pictures that I made in the drapery series, um, which was now an extension of the, the kind of naked heads. And now she was completely engulfed in her drapes, etc. cetera. Uh, by the way, this picture, which is called Royal, was also on the cover of that book, but um, <laughs> it was actually used for a completely different purpose. A friend of mine and I did, well, I did a, um, I curated a show of outsider art on the, on the theme of Elvis. And my friend made me these drapes, which are replicas of the drapes at Graceland in Elvis's living room. Just, just an aside for you to know. Anyway, so back, back to the drapery. So I was also like realized that, you know, what are the other women figures that have a lot of drapery in them? And I was brought up Catholic, et cetera. And I was also thinking about Western um, statues and having lived in Europe for a while, it was kind of like, again, pieces coming together. But they mostly came together from this source, which is I had mercy nuns in grade school and I had Dominican nuns in high school. And these women, you know, were only known through the identity of all this fabric that they were wearing. Um, and when a nun takes her name, you know, instead of her being, you know, Sister Patty Carroll, she's now maybe Sister uh, Jean-Marie or Sister Immaculata or something like that. And so her whole identity has changed and you only see her through the guise of these, these veils, basically. So I started making these pictures kind of in tandem with some of those ideas coalescing. There was also one more influence, which was um, the wonderful story from Gone with the Wind, if any of you know it, where um, Scarlett O'Hara uh, needs to save her, her home, Tara, which is this great southern plantation. And she pulls down the green drapery in her in her living room and makes a big dress out of it so that she can go and make a big impression and ask, in this case, Clark Gable for some money to save it. It not, didn't quite work, but it did coalesce with me in terms of drapery, home, that's what means things. So this was one of the first pictures I made from this. So this is um, domestic bliss, it's called. Um, Anyway, in, the, in these pictures now, instead of just having an object on her head, she's completely engulfed in fabric or drapery or something. Um, and staying home is like one of those uh, responses we have when things become a little too hectic or too crushing or whatever. So you will find the woman camouflaged in her various guises. You may also notice that a lot of these have a kind of vintage look to them because as I was uh, looking for things to furnish this uh, mythical house that I had, I was also finding a lot of vintage fabrics. And so this is some bark cloth drapery. Um, 
I started including a prop or two. Um, this in this one, she's wearing a cake plate upside down, and and this one, which is called Kilim, um, instead of taking all the rugs out of my house to the studio, um, we took the model and the lights to the house, and we just picked up everything and engulfed her in it. A lot of times, by the way, um, people ask me like, who's behind these drapes, right? And my response is always, uh, it doesn't matter who it is. In fact, I did a talk one time in China and I, and I went into this long explanation about how my anonymous woman stands in for all of us, et cetera. And they said, yeah, yeah, we know all that, but just who is it? And my husband says, well, just tell them it's Meryl Streep. It doesn't make any difference. Anyway, so my women wanted to talk. How can you talk if you haven't got a brain? I don't know. But some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? Yes, I guess you're right. I think so too. So I made some pictures that started talking a bit. So I started making these really short videos, uh, mostly because, well, I, I wanted to see them move a little bit. And uh, I Photoshop had just come out with a video editing component to it. So I was very keen to learn how to use that. So I did. But anyway, a lot of these pictures then uh, became a little more humorous as we went on. This one I always think of as like the person you know, the guy in the party that decided to wear the lampshade on his head. Or this one where she seems like she's floating a bit. Um, I'm big on lamps, so a lot of times there's a lot of lampshades in my pictures, um, as you can see here. And also, I, I'm in referencing, these are vintage um, drapes also. I, I found it in a state sale and they were still in the package from Sears from like probably the 1960s or something. But the whole idea was this of um, the perfect house when I grew up was the one where the walls, the wallpaper and the drapes and the upholstery on the couch, they all matched. And so in a lot of these, you'll see this attempt to have everything kind of come together and match. Um, of course, then we have the idea of, um, you know, the woman as the invisible provider and server of, of meals and comfort, et cetera. This one's called serve. Uh, then. So many dreams I can't deep inside me. I have to tell you that that picture was the first video we made and I made my niece stand behind the drapes and I said just turn on the the lamp and she was like she couldn't find the the switch for it and I kept thinking oh this is never going to work and then I went duh that's the whole point she has no idea what she's doing because she's <laughs> she's this invisible person behind all the drapery in her home, etc. So anyway, so the pictures went on and we'd make an occasional video or we also made, you know, the, the matchy matchy interiors. Uh, and this one, Martha Stewart would have been very proud of me because she, um, I found, a, and the way these pictures start, sometimes it's with a prop or it's uh, something. In this case, I had this apron, this dotted apron. So then I found this dotted fabric to put her in and then found this magically, I found this uh, teapot that she's wearing on her head, but we didn't have a background. So we ordered a bunch of um, circle labels and then we just put them on a black background and we thought, okay, well, you know, you have to make do with what you've got, right? Again, uh, pictures 
start with maybe a in this case a prop i found this this hat and i thought well we got to do a striped picture so it kind of just things go on from one point and then they just keep going which is fortunate or unfortunate mm -hmm. As you can see, that was a one off, by the way. <laughs> so now I'm going to go back to Britain. Um, this was a Victorian interior picture from who knows when, early 1900s. And I think like a lot of uh, interiors in Victorian Britain, it was full of objects and pictures and drapery and fabric on the walls and chandeliers on the top, you know, and and it was you were there was a lot of clutter and a lot of objects and so i started thinking about how could i expand this series and i wanted to include more objects so i started making pictures this was now a new iteration of of the anonymous woman where she became and just part of a whole bunch of other things in her house where she's slightly less camouflaged but um more objects are taking over. Uh, and, and I was trying desperately to have her like sort of blend in as much as possible. We started this picture because I found this um, uh, broom that has this zebra stripe on it, which is not much, but then it kind of, we went kind of crazy after that and just <laughs> kept, kept going with the black and white patterns. Um, so this whole project was called Anonymous Women Reconstructed. And it's about women in her home, et cetera. Um, and- People always say, what do you like most? Now, I don't wanna brag, I don't wanna boast. I always tell them I like toast. Yeah, toast. Yeah, toast. So things changed because then we had to do uh, pictures using a mannequin rather than a real person um, because the sets became very elaborate. And then the mannequin sort of stood in for a real person and she was a more idealized version of the real person. So these, these reconstructed pictures, she's still pretty stiff in there, but she becomes part of her, her uh, background. In this one, of course, she's showing off her plate collection. And this one is called Trophy Wife, which, you know, is she becomes part of the a trophy herself, which I have to tell you has become a very popular picture, which is surprising to me because it's supposed to be a joke on the idea of Trophy Wife. Anyway, um, and then this picture uh, is called Tubby. And we started, I started to think that the image, the figure was too stiff and I wanted her to have more interaction with her interior. And I also wanted her to kind of be a victim of it rather than just in it. And so sometimes pictures like that start with a sketch and you can see how elaborate the sketches are. It's, you know, oh, we'll put some blue in it and it's, it's like this, but what we did is you'll see this. So it went through some iterations before it became the picture that it is, which is true of a lot of these pictures because they, they start one way and then they kind of end up somewhere else. Um, so then the next part of the final part of the series where I'm at now is called domestic demise, anonymous women domestic demise. And I started thinking about well, what does this woman do in her house besides, you know, hide behind her drapes, but she, she cooks and she cleans and she, you know, has her collections, etc. So this one was, she's cleaned out. 
And this one was uh, about doing dishes, which um, I'll tell you the story that was influenced on mine. When I went to college, which every, you know, everyone goes to college and then they go away and then they come back at Thanksgiving, you know, during their first semester. And that's what I did. And I came back and my mother had suddenly in our kitchen, there was a dishwasher that appeared, which had never been there before. And I came back and I said, mom, you bought a dishwasher. And she said, yeah, well, you went away. What was I going to do? So, so <laughs> sometimes you, you can tell where I get my sense of humor, number one. And number two, you can also see that, you know, things that kind of stick in your mind show up in a very odd place later on in your life. So all of this domestic demise uh, series is really just about how the woman is part of her home, her home becomes her identity, and she's done in with, by it in some particular way. Um, this is my uh, <clears throat> homage to Andy Warhol, shall we say? Uh, we wanted to do a pantry picture. So, and a lot of times, all, like in all of them, they start with a color frame, color or patterns that we're going to use. So then everything has to match. So we couldn't have any cans that were just like, you know, green or something. Um, and then, and then this series also, I try and um, they, they, in this particular case, this picture started with a title which was it's pie eyed and I wanted to do a picture about pies and pie eyed and so then I spent you know weeks searching for all these ceramic uh, pie plates and covers and then I of course didn't have enough of them and then we had to go buy more pies and real pies and so it's all kind of a mixture of fake pies and real pies etc of course after I finished the picture Every thrift store I went to, every antique mall I went to, they all had these pies, but I didn't need them anymore. Anyway, so uh, again, here she is trying to have a decent meal. Look what happens. She's trying to read. This one was one of the first ones called Bookie. And uh, I just want to say that in, in a lot of these pictures, um, things that are not real obvious took us hours and hours and hours and days to make. We covered all of those books, the outside of the books with wallpaper samples so that you didn't read the titles. Um, there's a couple places where you can kind of see them, but as soon as you see them, it, to me, it kind of takes away from the experience of the whole picture. So that's kind of the extent of how elaborate we get with all of these things. Um, this picture, it's called Cooking the Goose, has turned out to be the most popular picture I ever made in my life. I don't know. I guess it's because she is multitasking and she is in the oven herself. But it also was kind of referencing, you know, all the things that go on in a kitchen and the chaos that ensues. Um, the idea of too much furniture, a lot, uh, many of the um, women that I've noticed who have seen my photographs in exhibitions will walk around and they'll say, okay, that one's me. I have way too much furniture. Or, you know, the green bean casserole one, which if you live in the Midwest, it seems like every holiday out comes the green bean casserole, right? Which by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Campbell's soup actually invented the green bean casserole so that you would use mushroom soup in it. Anyway. So after I did this picture, I had some green beans and I thought, well, you know, I've never made this casserole myself. <clears throat> so I decided to do it from scratch. And, um, and it was like a labor of love after the picture was a labor of love. And I gave it to my, my brother and sister-in-law and they said, oh my God, it was the best. <laughs> you know, they went on and on. And I was like, I never want to see this again in my life. Anyway. And then of course there's the jello picture which is also a staple at, at many events. And this is um, another little time-lapse in how we're making these. You may notice, particularly in this picture, you see this 
like little stage thing. Well, all of these pictures are made within that little stage. Got it. <laughs> um, other influences from, from these pictures, um, this series, this particular picture is called Wallpapered, but it was uh, influenced if, I'm sure in your women's studies, they've read the yellow wallpaper Victorian essay, or not essay, but it's a short story about this woman who basically is locked up in her bedroom and by her husband and doctor and she basically goes mad as she starts peeling off bits of her wallpaper so sometimes it's kind of fun to have something to directly reference uh, this one is it was cat lady i i couldn't help but make a cat picture i have more cat pictures actually um, and then this one we did during the pandemic when everybody was freaking out about you know, washing their vegetables and not just wearing masks, but having everything covered and wearing gloves, etc. So we made this interior and we just covered everything in plastic. The only thing that's not covered in plastic is the cat at the bottom. And then this, <laughs> I'm not sure what, oh, I included this picture because similar to the books, um, all of these new uh, suitcases um, I learned how to decoupage because of this picture. And so all of the suitcases are fabrics that I found and then decoupage them onto the suitcases. It's called tripping. And while I was doing the suitcases, my assistants were making the paper airplanes. So it became, you know, a very elaborate making of, of stuff in order to make the picture work. Um, this this picture I think is relevant now that we've we're coming out of the pandemic and people don't know what to wear again I I was at a dinner last night and every all the women said this is the first time I've had a dress on in two years I don't know what to do and so it's called crise de couture but it's all about like your closet and what to wear etc um uh newspapers um we I was struck by how much news we have to listen to all the time and the variety of sources we get it from. Yes, the internet, yes, newspapers, TV, you know, radio, everywhere. And when I grew up, my parents owned suburban newspapers. So I had to do a picture that referenced again this overwhelming sense of how much news we get every day, but also back to kind of my roots of childhood. And this one's just called blues and hopefully everyone can relate to it because, you know, when you have the blues, the best thing to do is watch TV and eat popcorn. Anyway, so this series is kind of where I'm at now. Um, it You can see it goes through various kinds of situations and um, if I, this one, I'll just mention this, is uh, called um, scrapbooking, and she has scissors in her hand. The there was a movie that was a Hitchcock movie, uh, which was later made into a Perfect Murder, but the Hitchcock movie was called Dial M for Murder. I'm a big Hitchcock fan, but <clears throat> and in that movie, uh, her husband goes off with a friend to a dinner and says, you stay home, dear, and and why don't you fill up, fill in all of those um, uh, scrapbooks that you have, you've been wanting to do for so long. In the meantime, he has hired somebody to come and stab her um, and kill her from behind who comes through the drapes on the side. And she instead takes a pair of scissors and kills him. So this picture has a little bit of reference to all of that stuff in it. And we go back 
all the way to the drapes and to being covered with one of these pictures. This is the last picture we did. Um, uh, I was, <laughs> there were big Tupperware show uh, parties in, in the 50s and 60s. And so I recently, well, first of all, I had, I had a show with Bill Owens and if there's any photography students out there, they might know Bill Owens photographs. Uh, he was a photographer who mostly is known for his book called Suburbia, which he did in the 1970s. And one of the pictures in that book is called is a Tupper is an actual Tupperware party. And I was in a sh I had there was a two person show in Dallas and he had that picture in it. And I was like, oh, my God, I forgot. I haven't done a picture about Tupperware yet. So we finally did one. Also, in the newest version of Mrs. Mais Mais Maisel. Have any of you watched that series? Watch the new series because she, she goes to a Tupperware party. Um, anyway, last things I want to show you is um, sometimes these things become installation when, I, when they're shown, become installations. So this drapery picture um, is in front of the actual drapes and this rather elaborate um, uh, stage that was all sewn together by my friend Joel. So she, she, the picture is hanging in front of the actual objects or the drapes that were in that picture. And then this one, um, which was called Picnicky, I've shown it like this, um, kind of on the floor also, and made the installation of an actual picnic around her. And here, it, this is. Um, a recent uh, iteration of that in a show I have up in LA right now. And then I thought maybe you'd like to see this because back to the stripes, we covered the walls in one of the rooms um, and showed those pictures as well as some of the videos in the same room. And um, this picture, <laughs> this was a picture I made in the studio, but then it came to life also uh, in an installation. So the picture is at the back end of the wall and then all of the, the plastic stuff that we all use every day was included in the front of it. I took my troubles down to my you know that gypsy with the gold cap too. She's got a bag down a pretty floating pine. Selling little bottles of love potion number nine. So the idea of identity is a big issue. Come back tomorrow. And that is the question. <laughs> so I will stop sharing this and hope you can ask me some questions if that works. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was so much more <laughs> enlightening than what I was even expecting. And I would just want to start off, of course, by saying thank you. And also sure. that your work is so much more humorous, both, both lighthearted and dark humor than I was expecting. And I'm so glad that you included that last panning shot of the gallery. So I was gonna ask if you ever ex exhibit any of the videos. I think that it, it totally heightens the humor that's in the still images. 
Um, so with that, I'd love to open it up to our audience and ask if anyone has any questions they'd like to share. Feel free to pull yourselves off mute or to drop something into the chat. We've also dropped Patty's um, website into the chat so you can check out more of her work and you can see the work that she has in our art collection in the, right through the second link that we've dropped into the chat. For the videos, um, you have them paired with songs. Do you normally come up with the inspiration based off the song or do you find a song that fits with your videos? Usually it, we find the song that fits with the videos. Um, because when we're doing it, you know, I, I might or might not have something in mind. Usually I don't. I just kind of go through my um, vintage collection of, of songs and find something that seems to be appropriate. Patty, we've Is got a more question. Go ahead. Uh, the question from Olivia, uh, what thoughts or recommendations do you have about how art and culture should emerge and be presented? That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, art is culture, I think. Um, and if you mean a, a, a larger social sense, I think that is something I am trying to <clears throat> address in, in my pictures because it's about uh, consumption and as well as identity. And so I think there's so many ways that that can be where art and culture are combined and show up. I'm not sure I can give you any specific, I, that's, it's too big of a question. I need it to be more specific, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can chime in a little bit. So Olivia's oh, question makes me think about capitalism in general and, and all mm. of the related you know, offshoots, how advertising plays a role in our everyday lives and just the abundance of stuff that we're confronted with every day. And you know, you kind of hinted at that in your work, especially I'm thinking of that last piece that you shared with all the plastic that's floating. But do you think about capitalism itself frequently? Does that play a part in your process? Yes, often. Um, I didn't show the picture, but I actually did a picture with money, <laughs> yeah. you know, just a direct picture. But um, also, one of the reasons that, um, I mean, we all have too much stuff, no matter uh, what we collect, whether it's, you know, people who ac collect actual art objects or people who collect, you know, tablecloths. It doesn't matter. We all seem to have... Uh, collecting and and objects and the things we surround ourselves with as part of our identity and that's directly related to capitalism consumerism and it especially and it's not just uh limited to the united states i don't think but i think we kind of lead the way in that and so part of the message in these things by using so many objects in the pictures is to emphasize that point that, you know, maybe we could do with less. Yeah, I definitely had a, a feeling of a reminder of consumption when I saw a lot of the work with so much of yeah. the objects intertwined with it. Uh, we got a couple other questions here, Patty, one from Allison. Um, have you had the same assistant for a long time? And do you work with students? Uh, um, I have had the same assistant for a long time. Uh, she and I, she's been with me, I would say, mm, eight to 10 years, something like that. Um, and she found me after when she was a senior in college, and then she just stayed on. It's not full time for her. So she's taking, she does other jobs, etc. cetera. Um, and I have a second assistant who just graduated from Columbia College in Chicago. Um, so, and she came to us when she was still a student. Um, what I don't like to do though, is have interns because they come in for maybe a semester, work, work a bit, teach them everything they need to know, and then they go away. And I need people who understand the process and what we're trying to get at and do things on a more consistent basis. 
Uh, and then I have a question for Julie. This, I, I thought one of the enlightening things of your talk too was the behind the scenes uh, shots of you creating it and taking the, those photos. And so uh, Julie has a question that asks, on average, how many pictures do you take of your setup for each session? And are you uh -huh. using sequential images to create your motion sequences or are they derived from video footage? Okay, let's, the first part was how long does it take? How many pictures do you take of yourself? Oh, how many pictures? Years? Okay, so so the process is that um, it takes us a while to get it set up, and and you could see through the time lapse that we go through different iterations before it starts to gel, and then once we get to the point where I think it is almost there, then we take a few pictures take them back, look at them on the computer on a big screen so we can see the details and then decide, oh, we need to change this, we need to change that, we need to move this, whatever it takes. And that process could be 10 times, it could be 20 times, it could be any number of times. So because the, the process is that we're making everything in front of the camera, um, we have to look at it from that same point of view each time. And then that, so it might be, it might be 30 pictures that we take before we finally end up with the one. Um, okay, what was the second part of that question? Sorry. Second part of the question is, are you using sequential images to create the uh, motion sequences or are they derived from video footage? Okay, so the time, there's the time-lapse ones are, they're time-lapse, they're just, uh, my, my new a little assistant <clears throat> will set up a little camera, set it on timer, and then every so often it takes those pictures. Um, the, so we, we do some video footage. Um, it, it's both. I guess that would be the answer. It's, it's both. We do time lapses and some videos. Great. Thanks. And then another question from Allison. Uh, she wants to know what you do with the props when you're done with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> I try and get rid of them. <laughs> Some things, though, you know, I, I have a, uh, the cool thing about my studio is I don't have enough space in it, but I have a huge garage and it has sh steel shelves full of bins of fabric and stuff and furniture. And every now and then what we do is uh, take stuff back to Salvation Army, you know, or like I, I try and get rid of stuff, but it doesn't always happen. And because there's always more coming in. So it goes back and forth. Um, it's a real, it's a real disaster, actually having too many things. But it is a round robin of buying things at thrift stores and then taking them back to thrift stores. But some things are too good like you know there's some lamps in there that are in my house <laughs> got it <laughs> are there any objects that you've used multiple times for multiple images um yeah things do show up again um but we we tried not to or if if it was in a picture that was where it was prominent we try and put it in a very little way in another one um and that's the joy of having an assistant who's been with me a long time because she'll say, oh, I think we used that. And I'm like, yeah, I think we did too. The other thing that we've done, uh, we did this year was made, I have a notebook, um, you know, a ring binder notebook. And I've made all, I took every picture and made it into an eight and a half by 11. So that, and put it in this notebook so that we can tell like what we've done and we can have an, an easy reference instead of going online. So um, that, that has helped us quite a bit. The other thing about that is that um, this show I have up in LA right now, it's a big show. It has like 35 pieces in it. And we wanted to do the show based on color. So it goes from yellow to orange to red to green, somewhere in there is green and blue and then eventually purple. Um, and we couldn't have done that if we didn't have those smaller pictures that we could lay out in a really big way. Um, so 
you know, that's a little logistical issue that we have going on. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Little things that you don't learn about in school. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Patty, we have a question from Nicole. She wants to know how much manipulation of the objects do you do versus finding the right piece? Oh, um, finding the right piece is 90%. And I don't, um, we will do things like spray paint. Like there's, there's a lamp we've used like three times and it's been different colors in each one because we've spray painted it. So a lot of the manipulation comes of the object itself. For instance, um, we've used chairs that have become, you know, they were white in one picture and red in another, that kind of thing. Um, but for manipulation on the computer, it's not so much. Mostly what I do is uh, basic stuff of, you know, fixing the shadows and highlights and maybe changing a color maybe just by more saturation or something but the basic picture is in front of the camera there's least manipulation as i can get away with i do however take out fishing line if i can um kind of related i'm interested in asking a, a sort of technical question about lighting one of the things that really strikes me about your pieces is how like seamlessly lit they are everything's very even there's some images that even feel kind of flat and i'm just wondering about what your average lighting setup looks like i'm sure that they're different okay. for everyone um well i don't know if you could see in, in a couple of them but all right so the we saw the little stage right that is an eight foot by eight foot back drop and then four foot walls and so on top of that um are three soft boxes pointing down. And then in front, there are two huge soft boxes at 45 degree angles, mostly going inside. But then for a lot of the pictures, there's, there's not enough light behind the front curtain. So often we will uh, hide a couple more either soft boxes or these other little strobe units that I have to, to pump up the light back there. And which adds to the, the idea, as you say, of the flatness of them. Not all of them are that way, but when necessary. So th there could be, there's always at least five lights, maybe sometimes seven or eight. That's a yeah. ton. I'm, I'm picturing like a month's worth of work for one image. Is that pretty common? Oh, no, no, it doesn't take us that long because we've got it down to a science now. <laughs> of course. You but, but, but I will say I've never done one in one day, you know, so we're, we are talking days process, maybe two days. That's really fast too. Three to five days is more, more an, an average. Gotcha. Thank you. Patty, I have kind of a related question. Um, the it's it, in terms of the lighting and the setup, it also feels very theatrical. Um, yes. And, and you've got a really great sense of color and design. What kind of training uh, did you have related to that? Uh, well, I was a graphic design major in college. And, you know, and it comes in really handy, number one. But number two, we are always looking at those pictures in terms of like, what shape is it making? What colors are working together? Um, that's why we have to move stuff around because it, it can become a real mess real fast if you don't have a line or a shape or something that's going to define the whole parameter of the picture. So I am very aware, I think that's an interesting question. I'm very aware of shape, color, pattern, um, and lighting all at the same time. But graphic design was a real big help also because it's also about problem solving and that's all we do is solve problems <laughs> absolutely is there anyone that has any um final questions we're coming up on one o'clock eastern time um, so we'll open it up to just maybe one or two more questions if anyone has one i'm just going to say that oh sorry nicole okay. that 
<laughs> with the pieces that have um, many objects and things like that. And they're not overwhelming because they're organized, you know, and, and so it's more about it, it lets you, it lends you to want to continue to find things within the images rather than repelling you because it just feels like too big of a mess. I think if it wasn't as designed as well as you have done and, and there is an, like, you can certainly see from any stage when you're standing back that, it, that they look organized in a way that makes them then also approachable. So I love having your works up and I know our students do as well. Thank you. Um, you know, part of my, I guess, if I have a philosophy, is that I want these pictures to be um, approachable by anybody or identify, you know, someone can look at them and identify with them. And that they're not just for an art audience, but they're for everybody. And I try really hard so that that's why I think if there's if there's a heaviness to a message in the picture, having bright colors or fun patterns and an organized set of designs makes it easier for you to look at the picture and then think about what that might be about. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. For sure. Nicole, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, Penny kind of just answered it, but I guess I, I couldn't really formulate a question, so that helped me. I guess it's it's so interesting to hear you talk about people finding themselves within your image, but literally having anonymous directly in the title of every single one of your images. And I, I guess I'm curious how that came up about. You know, did you do you think of specific people as you're creating these images, or do you leave them for yourself as anonymous stories being told? Um, I think of about them in terms of types of women, you know, rather than, um, I mean, I told a story about the dishwashing that was my personal story, but but the truth is, is everybody has to wash dishes, you know, <laughs> right? So, so there's a little bit of that. And then some of the styles of some of the pictures would never, certainly never be in my house. In fact, none of it probably would be, but, but I think about like how that that woman might have put that together somehow. You know what I'm saying? So it's I'm trying to address um, types of people, not specific people. And the idea that someone is anonymous means she could be any one of us. I hope. Yeah, I think there's a lot to identify with in your work. And just a lot going on in general. Um, all right, well, I'm going to wrap things up for us. I want to thank you so much, Patty, for joining us. This has been a delight. Uh, for any students or faculty or staff that are still on the call, we've dropped a link to a survey. We're always looking for feedback on these types of events and suggestions for moving forward. And thank you all as our audience for joining us. So have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of these were students and faculty. All right. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, everybody. That's a wrap on events. Have a good one. Yay. <laughs> good job, everybody. That was great. Yeah. <laughs>